right, so back again to finish off the birth of the clinic here. Uh, a few things before jumping into it. Um, you can find this on Podbean or Apple Podcasts, wherever, you know. Uh, also, my Instagram, at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. Uh, my Patreon for anyone who can contribute to that, that would be great. Um, but if not, obviously that's cool. But still, I'll give a shout out to James, John, Matt, Nicholas, and Sebastian, who have been very helpful uh, in keeping me being able to do this as often as I can. That is every week, I guess. And of course, everyone stay healthy out there. Uh, stay home if you can. Uh, and we'll all make it through this. Now, um, I actually, I feel like I should um, contextualize that because in years I might listen back and be like, what the hell was I talking about? Because of the virus that's, you know, sweeping the world. Um, all right, so without any further ado, let's get back into where we left off here with chapter six titled Signs and Cases. Now, I want to say before jumping into this chapter that this particular chapter is broken into many parts, and because of that, it's difficult to trace like a kind of coherent thread through which or for which me to present. But I will try. I will try. So if it seems a little bit choppy, I'm doing uh, as good as I can here. So he begins this chapter with a long quote about how clinical practice should be done, how, it, how you know, training should happen. Now, I don't want to read the whole thing because it's long, but I do want to read one little section of it where he or where it's written. Uh, you must make the most of the patient's characters and command their will, not as a cruel tyrant reigns over his slaves, but as a kind father who watches over the destiny of his children. So that is a directive to a prospective uh, doctor, like a pupil of a, of a doctor, who is going to learn what to do and how to treat uh, patients. Now, of course, this presents a pretty paternalistic attitude, and it reveals the extent to which um, the patient is infantilized, and it illustrates the extent to which the gaze that the doctor assumes is an eye that knows and decides. That is and we've already kind of established this, we've moved beyond what the patient can offer in terms of their own discourse into it becoming more a prescriptive uh, engagement or interaction between a doctor and a patient. Now, this gaze is looking for something specific. That is, it's trying to understand what is going on, and Foucault kind of classifies it as follows. He says that the, the gaze is searching for structures, that is, forms, spatial arrangements, the number and size of elements, that all might provide more information, more data, as to what is going on underneath kind of the patient's skin, or going on with the patient. So here I want to read a little section that captures this transition really well, or kind of this movement of the gaze. Now this is on page 109 in my version. First, it was no longer the gaze of an observer, but that of a doctor supported and justified by an institution, that of a doctor endowed with the power of decision and intervention. Moreover, it was a gaze that was not bound by the narrow grid of structure, that is form, arrangement, number, size, but that could and should grasp colors, variations, tiny anomalies, that is always receptive to the deviant. Finally, it was a gaze that was not content to observe what was self-evident. It must make it possible to outline chances and risks. It was calculating. Now, with this, we are starting to move beyond nosography, right? So that was the kind of classificatory medicine that wanted to, you know, classify diseases in terms of their species and families and genera. Now we are moving into a more dynamic approach to healthcare. One that sees anomalies as not being things that we should just um, we we shouldn't consider, but are things that you know we can actually learn a lot from. Whereas previously the anomaly was something that if it didn't fit within the classificatory matrix, it would therefore be issued. It would be discounted. Now what we see emerging that is a consideration of these anomalies, a consideration of almost everything that happens, is a very um, like a strong relationship between the method, and we've already outlined that method being this gaze that sees and takes everything in, and the thing being seen. So what was seen became part of the knowledge structure, what he calls here the kind of codes of knowledge. Now these codes of knowledge assume two forms. 
that is the linguistic structure of the sign and the aleatory so aleatory means kind of like a uh, random um, random or, or I, I guess randoms the best word uh, so let me just repeat it comes in it comes in two forms that is the linguistic structure of the sign and the aleatory or random structure of the case so what does that mean a linguistic structure because the aleatory structure of the case that is of the patient kind of makes sense as to what we were saying because now we're considering anomalies changes developments kind of randomness of the patient but what does he mean when he says this linguistic structure well if we think about linguistics or semiotics on its own just for a second what we know is that a sign is made up of a signifier and a signified now Foucault transposes this onto the medical field to say that symptoms take on the role of a signifier to which they are signifying uh, a signified or a disease so the symptom is the signifier whereas the disease that ostensibly produces the symptom is the signified the symptom signifies the, the disease now this is a big transition because previously with nosography that was trying to find the kind of truth of diseases in themselves what the nosographer and what the doctor was trying to do was to kind of get away from the subject to get away from the individual in in a sense to get away from the symptom because symptoms you know they could change someone experiencing I don't know I, I just could take like um, I don't know people suffer from cancer in different ways and they manifest this uh, cancer in different ways even you know the exact same kinds of cancers so the old nosographers wouldn't be interested in the way that each individual person was manifesting these symptoms but would instead be concerned with the disease itself so in this new framework where there's a indelible association between the symptom and the disease the disease kind of loses its essence that is it kind of becomes just associated with the symptom itself so now we are no longer concerned with the disease its relationship to other diseases its relation its own history its relationship to you know itself we are now concerned instead with how it manifests itself and because that changes with different people it's hard to create that very implicit association between a specific symptom and a specific disease so the symptom then kind of speaks the truth of the disease now so far I've been saying it that you know different people might manifest diseases differently but it should also be noted that um, um, different diseases may produce the same symptoms so not just the same disease in different um, different bodies might produce different symptoms but the same disease might produce uh, or different diseases might produce the same symptoms anyways not totally important anyways Foucault relates this to Condillac's philosophy of the language of action now what is that the language of action uh, the language of action is quite simply the language that we have almost pre-language so like screams gestures grunts things that can convey various um, let's call them emotions they can convey various feelings without them being necessarily linguistic so these symptoms for Foucault are kind of like this language of action that is they are kind of pre-linguistic things that point to something else without there being a kind of understandable link but it's something that we just somehow are expected to know like uh, like a snake hissing at us is a sign that you know we should back off if you produce certain kinds of lesions on the body that is a sign that you know probably this thing is wrong with you so on their own symptoms mean very little right there was almost uh, a necessity of a kind of medical intervention in order for the uh, symptom to attain a certain status right because previously the only concern was the disease itself now this does two things that is it is able to kind of plot or allows the clinician or the doctor to kind of plot a trajectory of the disease so you can say like oh you're suffering this symptom um, it could go <laughs> the symptom could get worse or it could you know get better and then that is kind of laying out what might happen for the obviously in a much more uh, rigorous and nuanced way I'm not a doctor 
uh, or, and or it's not or, and um, what this does is it actually reinforces the position of the clinic as a kind of prophetic character, that is, as something that can kind of um, justify its own existence because of its capacity to recognize symptoms, recognize them in relation to disease, map out what might, you know, come of that in order to give a kind of um, strong possibility as to what will happen. And yeah. So I mentioned it briefly earlier that in semiotics, a sign is produced by the meeting of a signifier and a signified. Now Foucault says here that when you have a symptom, what you have is a signifier. You don't necessarily have a sign though. He says that um, you can essentially have a symptom without a sign, but you cannot have a sign without a symptom. So, uh, example, or rather than giving you a poor example, he tells us that um, a symptom only becomes a sign, quote, beneath a gaze that is sensitive to difference, simultaneity, or succession and frequency. So this sign then is a, quote again, spontaneously differential operation devoted to totality and to memory and calculating as well. So previous to that, when we were just dealing with a signifier and a signified, there was just a kind of attachment between um, the symptom and the disease. Now it becomes a sign when that signifier, that symptom, enters into a code of knowledge, into a kind of lexicon, into a kind of field of, of um, medical thought and medical knowledge that is able to situate these symptoms on their own, right? To be able to say that, you know, you have this symptom, therefore, bam, it could be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, however many of these possible diseases in order to kind of give a broad, um, all-encompassing understanding of what the symptom points to as the sign. Now this operation, that is this location of symptoms within a field of knowledge, is not a natural thing, right? This happens through um, the introduction of various sorts of, you know, knowledge production, various sorts of organization, you know, various distributions of knowledge, these Foucauldian things, right? Now it doesn't happen naturally, but it attains a degree of naturality because of what it's focused on. And in this case, it's focused on disease. So disease is assumed to have a kind of natural status. And this natural thing manifests itself on the natural body. Therefore, the clinic, the doctor are able to naturalize their gaze over this body because they are able to predict where it's going to go, how it's going to develop, how this disease is going to move. And it gives them a kind of um, I want to say transcendent, but that's a little bit dramatic. It gives them a pretty powerful status in the kind of cultural sphere in which it's housed. But of course, this begs the question, is, a, is the truth of a natural disease um, reducible to its symptoms? To which we kind of have to say no, because the disease lives on its own. Um, it, you know, a virus isn't... Uh, an organic thing, I guess, but, or it doesn't really have life, I guess, but it is a thing that exists on its own and has its own properties. And the way that it manifests itself on the body is relatively arbitrary. Now it is the task of the clinic to turn all symptoms into signs. So therefore it could have a kind of stranglehold over what proper medical knowledge can look like, over what, you know, what can be known how it should be known, and how it should be taught. And so with this, we see symptoms and diseases being entered into a certain kind of linguistic paradigm, into a certain kind of uh, field of, of, of language, one that is, you know, approved by this medical establishment. Now, all these things that kind of culminated into the development of this thing called the clinic were, were in the service of making all sick people, quote, part of a progressive and theoretically endless convergence, which is interesting because it um, the clinic embeds within its own logic the possibility for it to continue ad infinitum, right? So it's not like before where there was a project of uncovering kind of the truth of diseases, 
right? Because that would have probably have an endpoint, or you know would have a pretty slow progression if you know new diseases emerged. Then it would try to codify those, and then when that was done, it might have nothing to do, or whatever. But now what we have is a continually moving thing that adapts to all the continually moving people. And as I said briefly before, any kind of um, alterations, any kind of divergences from the norm were historically discarded, right? They were discounted. Now they are turned into something positive because they, you know, the more variations there are, the more reason there is for this kind of medical gaze, this kind of medical establishment to exist. Now this Foucault kind of ascribes this a name. He calls this the kind of probabilistic nature of, of the clinic in that uh, because everything is happening in a kind of aleatory, unpredictable way, all we can do is kind of um, put forward probabilities of what might happen or what might transpire. So this was, again, another tactic of the clinic to, I guess, advertise itself as a kind of natural solution to the natural problem of disease. And that is because with its probabilistic character, it could say, hey, we are in line with what Foucault here calls the free profusion of nature. And this was an idea, of course, developing at the time that, you know, civilization was something that was rigid, fixed. Nature was the unpredictable wild that was out there. And disease, is, disease was kind of like nature finding its way into civilization. So it was the job of a medical establishment to recognize that and to be able to implement that very logic into itself in order to kind of curb that threat. So this transition into this kind of probabilistic approach happened in four stages for Foucault. The first one is the complexity, he calls the complexity of combination. So previously, uh, with nosography, classification of disease was a way by which to make the disease manageable. So this was to focus on disease itself or its symptoms. Well, well, that is, to focus on a disease itself or its symptoms was to complicate things, right? That was to move away from the truth of the disease. However, with these new changes, these kind of probabilistic ones, what we see is a kind of homogenization of symptoms as signs. So their complexity vanishes, right? It's almost like a, a Hegelian thing, like we, uh, okay, well, I should explain what I mean by that. For Hegel, it's like, instead of looking at what makes us different, let us try to kind of galvanize a group identity around difference. So we are not um, separated individuals. We are all the same because we are all individuals. So here, difference was kind of subsumed under a broader understanding of what the medical establishment should be looking at, and hence probability, randomness, stuff like that. All right, the, the second stage, the principle of analogy. So we can kind of cla or understand this with his own words best. He says that analogy is no longer a more or less close kinship that vanishes as one moves away from the essential identity. It is now an isomorphism of relations between elements. It concerns a system of relations and reciprocal actions, a functioning or a dysfunctioning. Thus, difficulty in breathing is a phenomenon that is found in much the same morphology in this, this I don't know how to pronounce that, asthma, heart disease, pleurisy, and scurvy, but it would be misleading and dangerous to attach too much importance to such a resemblance. So here we have the introdu introduction of this kind of analogous framework where there are these associations drawn between symptoms, between diseases, into this kind of network of this code, these codes of knowledge. Okay, and here the third stage, perceptions of frequencies. So here's a quote, Medical certainty is based not on the completely observed individuality, but on the completely scanned multiplicity of individual facts. So in the medicine of species, that is that older form, um, abnormalities and variations were dis discounted, right? So this was in the face of a kind of homogenous disease. In the clinic, however, the abnormalities are effaced in their being normalized and entered into the domain of medical observation and knowledge. So this new approach was anathema, 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 David, 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 was anathema to a kind of medical mathematics that was much too rigid. And th that was, those, those are my words, that's not Foucault. Um, so it wasn't mathematical, 
in that, you know, a mathematical uh, structure would be much too rigid, right? It was much more organic in that it allowed variation, which is all, I feel like I'm being repetitive, but gotta say it. And then the fourth and final stage here, uh, the calculation of the degree of certainty. So despite all the attempts to attribute a kind of mathematics to symptoms, a kind of grand plan or map, no such plan was uncovered, obviously. So this is because um, this attempt mistook symptoms and signs as an arithmetic of cases, or, or arithmetic, eric, Jesus, an arithmetic of cases, rather than as a connection with a set of phenomena. So only when it was able to recognize that, that there wasn't this arithmetic there, was the clinic actually able to kind of emerge as a grammatical and probabilistic structures, or, or was able to kind of implement those. Now that pushes us here into chapter 7, titled Seeing and Knowing. So Foucault isn't, you know, totally off his rocker. He recognizes that all medicine has been predicated upon some kind of act of looking, some kind of gazing. The clinic does it differently, however, in, what, in how he cl classifies it as follows. With the introduction of a pure gaze, prior to all intervention and faithful to the immediate, which it took up without modifying it, and those of a gaze equipped with a whole logical armature, which exercised from the outset the naivety, naivete of an unprepared empiricism. So it's important here that the gaze does not seek to modify or change. It does not seek to kind of intervene into the body, which means that there must be a kind of distance fostered between uh, the, what the doctors know and the truth of what is being observed. And what this is, that is this encounter, is a meeting of a logic of operations, that is a gaze, a kind of knowledgeable gaze, uh, and a genesis of totalities, that, that, that is the things being seen or the patients under observation. And so the clinical domain involves two kind of uh, subdomains, that is the hospital domain and the teaching domain. And that is because health care was very much wrapped up with the very process of learning how to do health care. Because it was always a kind of like teacha teachable moment in the act of healing. So it was the hospital domain where uh, was a site where the pathological fact appears in its singularity, right? It, you know, we are just observing something happening in its truth. So this was, this was to foster a kind of neutral domain where comparison is possible and open. And this essentially homogenizes pathologies as pathologies, as being, you know, the non-normative. So what this does is it kind of bridge the gap between teachers and students. So someone learning about medicine would be, you know, when they're doing their stage or their placement or whatever, would be among a doctor going, you know, um, bed to bed, looking at various patients. And what this did was for Foucault disturb the kind of didactic approach, you know, where people would be sitting in a room uh, and then a doctor, a professor would just be telling them what to know. What we see here instead are two people, that is uh, a teacher, a doctor, and a pupil, kind of both learning at the same time in this kind of pragmatic act of healing. So going from like bed to bed. So what this, um, I guess, the encounter between the pupil and the teacher transforms from that, from being an encounter between the pupil and the teacher, to an encounter simply between those who unmask and those before whom one unmasks. So the doctor is seeing something very new in many cases, and therefore so is the, the pupil. Now doesn't this present a problem? If the clinic you know, is so prepared to accommodate rapid changes, variations, stuff like that, how does it take on an identity of its own? Like, it doesn't seem to have a kind of singular MO, you know, a kind of modus operandi. It's, it doesn't have a single kind of operation that could clearly uh, allow it to be characterized or de delineated. So Foucault says that it finds its structure then, not in a kind of implicit identity or kind of implicit definition but rather in the meeting of the interrogation of interrogation and examination. So that is defining the structure of the encounter between doctor and patient. So it's not so much what the clinic is, but kind of like what happens in it. 
in that it is a space precisely for that kind of interaction between a doctor and a patient, between a doctor and a, and a pupil, that is, you know, part of its definition is that there is no definition because this encounter is always going to be different. And the clinic determines this interaction, this kind of locus between doctor and patient, in three different ways. So firstly, the alteration, alternation of spoken stages and perceived stages, stages in an observation. So what this is is an alternation between observation by doctor and testimony by patient. So the doctor sees the symptoms, but then associates those symptoms with testimony of patient's perceptions and history. So number two, so the effort to define a statutory form of correlation between the gaze and language. So it might appear that the efforts to represent or taxonomize diseases pictorially or graphically allowed for an un, uh, sorry allowed for an improved understanding of disease and their relationships to one another. Foucault says that this is a mistake. It's wrong to think that. For all these efforts were only to put into picture language exactly that which was already known. Okay, and then third, the ideal of an exhaustive description. So the pictorial effort did have an effect, though. It necessitated a concordance between a disease and the language used to describe it. The language had to be as precise as possible, but had to also allow for comparisons. So these were the kind of three things, some of the three things going on, three of the many things going on to kind of foster, to galvanize that relationship between the, the observing doctor and the patient suffering. Now the problem with kind of trying to represent diseases in a kind of pictorial way was that it was too rigid, right? It didn't allow itself or lend itself to the kind of fluidity that language does or linguistic structures do. Um, and what this was instead now was an effort to bring sight and speech together. And it was through this that a certain field of knowledge could emerge. Whereas, well, if you tried to represent something with like a picture, you galvanized it, you, you, you solidified what that thing is, and therefore it wouldn't allow for any kind of movement. So already we should get the sense that this is not where this clinic wants to go because it's too rigid. So out of this kind of like openness that we saw here, or we we're seeing here kind of emerge, a kind of openness to speech rather than a kind of uh, rigid um, pictorial uh, representation. Out of this openness that began with sight, a notably accessible practice, that is everyone can technically, provided you have, you're not blind or don't have another uh, disability, you can, you can see things, you can see the symptoms. Out of this emerged a new kind of esotericism. So esotericism is like a kind of um, specific understanding of something or a kind of specific domain of knowledge that is not accessible to everyone. So like esoteric knowledge would be like knowledge held by certain secret groups, right? That they don't share with anyone. So out of this openness that began with sight, which is a noticeably accessible practice, emerged a new kind of esotericism. So the old form of esotericism was a matter of knowing that which was unknown or hidden. So for example, like um, the person discovering disease was trying to discover the disease itself, that which cannot be seen, right? Whereas we can see symptoms, we, we can understand symptoms, but we can't really see the thing that is causing those symptoms. So the kind of knowledge that was accrued, the kind of knowledge that was amassed prior to this, was concerned with amassing that knowledge that was um, not easily available to anyone. It demanded a kind of very specific um, operation to uncover those things. Whereas now, when he's, you know, the thing he's describing, this is the early 19th century, kind of late 18th century, now there's a kind of esotericism among the things we can see. So this new esotericism is, um, is the containment of a specific language, a kind of, let's just say, um, maybe it's elitist, it obviously was, but a kind of um, specific language to understand and describe what everyone already knows, that is what everyone already sees. 
So the clinic then is a structure that balances, in Foucault's words, speech and spectacle. So this this is not to lead speech, lend to speech the truth of the spectacle in a kind of calculative capacity, but this is instead the process of determining a syntax in order to proceed from the element of the perceived to the coherence of discourse. So what the what the hell does that mean? Well, the clinic saw it kind of necessary to justify its own existence, right? We've we've already established this, and it did this by you know, making sure that it was able to um, develop its own vocabulary, its own kind of syntactical, that is kind of linguistic structures that would give it some degree of validity that would allow it to be justified in a certain uh, sphere. So that is in itself one of its properties and a pretty important one. And Foucault says that Its main interest is is kind of keeping itself alive, that is, in making sure that it is able to turn all these symptoms, as we've already said, into signs that can then be absorbed into this kind of vocabulary. And so then can be kind of maintained by a few people that belong to this kind of organization and foreclose it to others. Now, this came up with with some difficulties. It came up to some barriers. And these barriers take the form of four um, epistemological myths. So the first myth is that the uh, is called the alphabetical structure of disease. Now this is essentially the introduction of a kind of alphabetical structure into medicine, where symptoms are viewed like letters, and that uh, when put together make up systems of meaning. So like you know if you have coughing with with a certain kind of fever tied to like a like a I don't know, like a nasal problem. I don't know. Uh, these things are like letters in that when they're combined together, they can form a word, and that word is ostensibly the truth of the disease. Now, that, of course, doesn't fly, uh, and that's one of the things that the kind of linguistic uh, approach didn't want to do, right? It didn't want to turn it into a language like that, a kind of rigid language that would um, kind of quantify through letters what diseases were. So the second myth here is that the clinical gaze affects a nominalist reduction on the essence of the disease. So this is when the disease becomes real in a nominalist reduction, which strives to do away with universal and abstract objects. So that is, it comes down to its specificity. So at least that was the myth that the um, clinic tries to do away. So that's what a nominalist reduction is to do away with abstract ideas, with universalistic principles, uh, and instead to focus on the kind of here and now, you know, what is actually going on. Third myth, uh, the clinical gaze operates on pathological phenomena and and a reduction of a chemical type. So that is in the late 18th century, the nosographer mapped diseases, right? Following this, the clinician lets the disease speak and looks among its symptom language connections with other diseases. So the clinical gaze is kind of chemical here, at least as in the myth, uh, in the sense is that it corrodes things down to their furthest truth. Or sorry, in the sense that it corrodes things down to their furthest truth. That is, it gets at the kind of truth of the thing by getting through all the symptoms to find the real thing underneath. And it's chemically in that way because it's corrosive, like a chemical that burns, melts things away. And fourth myth, the clinical experience is identified with a fine sensibility. So that now, now we, that we are clear that there is an immediacy in the encounter between doctor and patient, that's something we're sure about, we must qualify that it's not just the anyone's senses that make up an appropriate observer, but those who have a fine sensibility. So this marks another transition, one that moves away from the nearly pure uh, sensible gaze to the glance. This is, And this is an interesting kind of linguistic uh, distinction that he makes here. Now the glance, he says, is a look that is not misled by the immediate forms of the sensible. So whereas the gaze, as we've been establishing it so far, is just the doctor looking at the patient, he wants to then supplant this or to replace this with a discussion of the glance. Now the glance is the gaze that isn't just a, a like anyone's gaze, it is a gaze that is inscribed within a certain institutional framework and has the knowledge that can make the appropriate deductions of the thing it's looking at. 
and unlike the gaze, this glance is not satisfied with surface appearances. It is concerned, it wants to go instead beneath things. It wants to go further than the skin itself. And here we enter a new phase of the clinic, uh, or a new kind of epistemological desire, which isn't totally new, and we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but this is a broader turn to um, the move of opening up bodies, like performing autopsies and whatnot. And that moves us here very appropriately into chapter 8, titled, Open Up a Few Corpses. Now he starts out this chapter by laying out a myth, and this myth kind of goes as follows. So this was a birth of a pathological anatomy. So that is, um, kind of doing autopsies is a pathological anatomy that some historians credited with the new medical spirit. Myth, but we'll keep going. So it was ironic that the opening of bodies occurred so late because many of the previous theories could have greatly benefited from it, right? So the reason it happened so late was interdiction by religious and cultural forces had to be done under cover of night. This was also the myth. So this transformed the dead body as a dark site of decay into a luminous site of knowledge. Now this was not true. It wasn't true that like people didn't like to cut open bodies or that there was like fear of um, uh, like religious persecution if you did if you cut open bodies through like uh, autopsy. That is a myth and it is one espoused by the clinic or the kind of you know many historians of the clinic for this reason. Um, it was essentially promoted by those belonging to the clinic and it was pushed to make it seem like the clinic was interested in discovering secrets of the body as a means of validating itself. But it wasn't really interested in this at all. And that is because the clinic was more concerned with the kind of moving surface of the body. It wasn't as interested in the, in Foucault's words, the mute in temporal bodies of like the inner organs and stuff. And this is adduced by the fact that people were performing autopsies, you know, out in the open for like medical knowledge, many centuries prior to this emergence of the clinic. And in Foucault's words, anatomy and the clinic were not of the same mind. So it's wrong for us to think like, oh, well, it, you know, the clinic emerged because we developed, uh, we were able to move away from the kind of interdictive uh, restrictions of the church. And we were then able to then cut open some bodies and figure out what actually makes people tick. That's not true. Uh, because the clinic and, and, and um, anatomy weren't really well linked. So prior to this, when um, I guess autopsy was first being conducted, or this kind of interest in cutting open bodies, it was believed that autopsies kind of revealed the objective real. That is the foundation for the description of disease. Which makes sense because, you know, if we cut open the body, we can see kind of the truth of the disease, where it starts, we can face it, trace its kind of genealogy and, and stuff like that, its movement throughout the body. And in that way, it lent itself pretty well to nosography, that is to, you know, the classification of diseases. And when aut aut autopsy finally did catch up to the clinic, when it finally did enter into the clinical domain as a kind of pathological uh, anatomy, it did so, it brought with it a kind of renewed interest in nosography because it was kind of getting at the, the truth of the disease in the disease's own terms, at least a little bit. Now, when the, this was introduced into the clinic, th there wasn't as much of an appreciation of what the autopsy might reveal because it was seen as being presenting limited knowledge because we are still dealing here with a dead body when the clinic relied fairly heavily on a kind of exchange between a doctor and a living patient. So what then could, could we do? Well, it was necessary then to kind of develop not only an understanding of what the dead body looks like, but what a ostensibly healthy body looks like. Because then if we were able to then, then if we were able to then, if we were able to then compare what a healthy body, dead body, looks like compared with a one that dies from a disease, then we can have a better understanding of the disease by just through process of elimination or comparison. Now, Foucault kind of classifies this, this new gaze, what he kind of said was the glance in the last chapter, 
and it's funny if you if you read the book he doesn't use that word again <laughs> he just uses the, he just goes back to the gaze but anyways um, he says that the gaze plunges into the space that it has given itself the task of traversing in its primary form the clinical reading implied an external deciphering subject which on the basis of and beyond that which it spelt out ordered and defined uh, defined kinships so with this what happens is that it is no longer a pathological species inserting itself onto the body wherever possible that is the disease it is instead the body itself that has become ill so that becomes apparent with the fact that the whole body is put under kind of investigation in this case through these kind of autopsies the whole body is turned into something that must be kind of truly uncovered truly revealed for the way that the, the disease has kind of made it ill that this the sick body now on first glance this might be evidence of a kind of shrinking of the gap between doctor and patient because the doctor is amassing more information about the truth of the patient that is what is happening under the skin instead for Foucault <laughs> this has more of a kind of sinister consequence that is a kind of sinister motivate motivation positioning bodies within a regime of structured knowledge turning them into subjects of a specific language game so he compares this knowledge to a more benevolent one characterized by accumulated adjusted refined and deepened knowledge um, and you know this comes about this new form of knowledge comes about when bodies are reduced not to like their own like characters or beings but are instead you know these things that must be observed and carefully uh, designated and, and 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 cut in order to be uh, their truth to be revealed and it is almost like the clinician's responsibility the doctor's responsibility to give that body its truth and in that right like giving the subject its truth and the fact that this is happening you know after death presents something really interesting for Foucault and it's something that has a kind of dual uh, consequence so it it kind of gives life to the, the the person that is their truth is being revealed but it also gives life to death because you know what was uncovered was the fact that after death happens there's an entire ecosystem that kind of goes into motion right you know there are various bacteria various organisms that get underway when someone dies now death was obviously seen as being a negative thing for a long time as was mentioned in kind of the first episode the first half of the book disease was the kind of climax of or sorry death was the climax of disease where the disease kind of attained its truth in the moment of death so you know doctors were like well we should probably then be cutting open bodies as soon as they die in order to get at the actual truth of the disease it in the moment right and it is with disease that a new kind of light emerges out of that where the last line of the chapter goes as follows the living night is dissipated in the brightness of death and that is because being alive there is so much within you that can't be seen or understood it is only with death when you can be kind of opened up and the light that or the kind of knowledge that comes from that which we are just equating with light reveals a lot about the the the, the living body and that pushes us here into chapter nine the visible invisible so here you know he reiterates that the corpse kind of ironically gives life to disease so the dead body gives life to disease so it is a site essentially for the livelihood of disease with its own laws so here are its laws uh, law number one that is the principle of tissue communication so this is essentially an analogy of structure uh, where in his words uh, for example in his words when the uh, envelopes of the brain are inflamed the sensitivity of the eyes and ears is sharpened so that's one of the laws that occurs you know through this analogous type thing some um, when some things are affected other things will be affected as well second law that is the principle of tissue impermeability so all tissue or like organs retain its own pathological character and is not necessarily affected by a neighboring inflammation for example so an inflamed kidney does not necessarily result in an inflamed what's near kidney liver I guess maybe why not um, number three a third law the principle of penetration by boring 
So this is the dissipation of previous two laws over long periods of time. So cancer can, for example, spread to different diseases, neighboring diseases, na sorry, neighboring organs. Fourth law, principle of the specific specificity of the mode of attack on the tissues. So some tissue here can be attacked on basis of its own properties. And then five, the principle of alteration of alteration, uh, which is to say that disease and tissue isn't rigid. It is, in his words, a life undergoing modification in an inflected functioning. So disease then does then does not oppose life. It is just a kind of pathological life. So this is a kind of ordering of disease that isn't nosological, right? Because it's not picking out specific diseases, locating them in relation, like ta taxonomizing them, putting them in families and species and all that. It's just looking at the kind of consistent properties within the body or how the body responds to disease. So this kind of imbues the disease with a kind of state of life or a status of life. It, it has life. It was able to participate in the dialectic of the organic versus the inorganic. So the organic was associated with life, whereas the inorganic was associated with not life. Because prior to this, disease was, you know, at times considered to be counter nature, right? Where the body, the organism was, was natural. The disease was that kind of unnatural thing that threatened the body at times. Now, Disease is able to take on this status precisely because death has been, or the, the, the dis distinction between life and death has been effectively blurred because disease was seen as the thing that ends life. Now, because we understand that life does not end with death, we see it continue in many different operations, what we can then do is enter disease into life itself. Now disease is understood or defined in its proximity to death, whereas before, you know, death was just seen as the kind of climax of the disease. And in his words, he says, death, which in the anatomical gaze spoke retroactively the truth of disease, makes possible its real form by anticipation. So whereas previously, in the clinical gaze, symptoms were signs of diseases, albeit loosely for coughing might be a sign of like a few different possible diseases, for example, in the an anatomo, anatomo, sorry, anatomo, anatomo clinical gaze, the sign is not to, de um, the sign is essentially not to detect a disease because this gaze likes specificity. Instead, the sign is a sign of itself. The sign refers only to the lesion, quote, never to a pathological essence. So the sign is only what it stands in for, for itself. It kind of, it's kind of like simulation here. And as a consequence, Foucault writes that the sign no longer speaks the natural language of disease. It essentially assumes shape and value only within the questions posed by medical investigation. There's nothing, therefore, to prevent it by being solicited and almost fabricated by medical investigation. So what this means is, is it essentially inscribes the body with a network of anatomopathological mappings, which saw move beyond sight to include the ear and touch as two other possible kind of sensory engagements with the sick body. So one example would be like putting a, a doctor putting their ear to the chest, right? To, you know, to get at the kind of what's going on, trying to get, hear what's going on underneath. Which, interestingly, Doc stopped doing and instead introduced the, the stethoscope because at the time there was fear that, you know, there was a lot of shame associated with the body, especially women's bodies with their breasts there. And so the doctor wanted a kind of intermediary between themselves and the uh, patient, in many cases the woman. And then contributing here to the, the simulation comment I just made, what this allowed for in Foucault's words is a kind of virtual image of what was occurring, where it wasn't a kind of real uh, immediate engagement, it was instead a kind of virtual um, mediated engagement with the thing being uh, kind of observed, with the body being observed. Now with all this, we should start to be getting the sense that there is a kind of esotericism, as I've already mentioned, like only a very strict, specific operation can perform these things now. So in that case, in Foucault's words, 
knowledge invents the secret, which is the invisible visibility. Knowledge invents the secret. And this is essentially the knowledge of the individual. So it's something we all see, and it's something we all believe of, in our, of ourselves. You know, we are this, these individuals. We have our own properties and, and truths. But how much of that is determined by a certain kind of, um, in this case, a clinical gaze that describes to us or onto us the status of a kind of individuality? So it's something we all know. But the truths of that are restricted to these specific spaces, these specific places. And, you know, it would follow how much of our own lives are under our own command, how much of it is dictated by these exterior forces. But I kind of digress. Okay, so back to the introduction of the of the ear and the and the hand and touching with, to the body here. What what this represents is a move from the gaze to what he calls here an absolute gaze, which structures into a sovereign unity, the eye, the ear, and touch. But again, we run up against the same problem because how does it actually attain a status, a kind of identity for itself, if its subject of inquiry, that is the thing that defines it, that very process, is always changing and adapting. And Foucault says, like earlier, in terms of the clinic more broadly, that it is able to attain an identity by internalizing that very logic of, perme of um, I guess, change into itself, that kind of aleatory structure into itself. So this is, in his words, the most differentiated structure, the one that is both the most, in his words, accidental and explanatory. That is, it is able to encapsulate whole slews of slews, whole, whole variations that the previous forms would not have been able to account for. And he concludes this chapter by returning to this idea about death, or this kind of interest in death, to say that death essentially became humans' invisible truth his visible secret, that is, his invisible truth, where we didn't know what it was that was killing us, but we knew we were dying, and his visible secret in that it housed all the possible um, truths within it, but that we couldn't actually see or understand because it was secret underneath the skin. At least that's, I'm, I'm going to have a little bit more humility here. That's how I think I understand it. If, <laughs> that's, how, that's what I think he means. But, you know, if anyone has a better idea, let me know. And that puts us here into chapter 10, Crisis in Fevers, which is going to be real short. So this turn towards signs as signs, that is the interest in signs purely as signs in themselves, uh, cast the disease into the intimacy of an inaccessible process. So it's, you know, it can only be fully understood then by a very specific medical establishment, medical domain of knowledge that knows how to properly read these signs turned into signs. Signs is signs. Sign squared. Sim the simulacrum of signs. So some doctors, in the case of fevers, so experiencing fevers, saw it necessary to kind of classify these signs as signs as uh, to kind of put it into a nosographical paradigm, that is to try to understand it that way and like classify it, while others did not. And others wanted to take on the new kind of clinical and anatomo-clinical approach. Anatomo-clinical. So this is like adduced by the fact that, you know, fevers kind of attain a status in themselves uh, where you can have like essential or sympathetic fevers, but they're often the product of disease, right? So to kind of reiterate, one camp saw it necessary to classify all these disease, you know, like fevers, and the other camp saw it necessary to just see it as a kind of purely local thing, right? Just happening in this body right now, and we can just deal with that. Now the second camp won one out became the kind of dominant uh, mode and this I should say you know he's just talking about what happened in the early like 19th century here medicine is totally different now there are similarities but like totally different so it'd be wrong to say like oh look um, Foucault is saying this about the medical establishment therefore that is how I should look at it today no 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 Dude, don't do that he's, he's just talking about the history of it here um so with this, with this kind of localization, diseases disappear for Foucault. What we are left with then are local, and here's a quote, complex movements of tissues in reaction to an irritating cause. And what this did is essentially solidify the end of the medicine of diseases, that is, the medicine of a kind of classificatory medicine in favor of these kind of purely local 
manifestations of disease. And that propels us here into the conclusion. So essentially, he gives a little summary about what the whole book was, and I'll read it right here. Or this is my short version of it. This book was a description of a point in history when the invisible became visible, and doctors embraced a gaze to them given to them by a new syntactical and epistemic structure for seeing. So this book also depended on a birth of idea of patient and the transformation of disease into something positive or something living. And essentially this all needed the entry of death into medicine. That was the book, the end. But before I actually finish, I have one quote I'd like to read. Um, quickly, oh my god, quickly. Better check the page here. Am I going to edit this out? Probably not. Probably not. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. All right. So he says here, but it is surprising that the figures of knowledge and those of language should obey the same profound law and that the eruption of finitude should dominate in the same way this relation of man to death, which in the first case authorizes a scientific discourse in a rational form and in the second opens up the source of language that unfolds endlessly in the void left by the absence of the gods question mark i didn't add the inflection because i didn't whatever because he ends with a little meditation on nietzsche uh you know the death of, the death of god you know thing like that um but yeah that's pretty well it if you have any questions, if I did something wrong, please let me know. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. I hope you got something out of it. I know these episodes are long, and you're probably like, well, just give me, I just want the, a two-minute version. I have no desire in doing that. But I might, actually. Might. Because, I don't know. Anyways, catch you next time. Stay safe. <laughs>